All right, hello everyone. So, seems like now we have 128 participants. Um, so, can everyone hear me? Okay. So yeah, so uh, welcome to the Polariton Chemistry Webinars. Um, this is the second event in this new weekly series. So it seems like some of you have some questions about the audio. So all audience members will have their audio and video muted. And so as I will talk later, you're able to ask questions during and at the end of um, this event. Okay, so um, let's begin. As you all know, the coronavirus hit and has been spreading all over the world in the past several months, um, causing nations worldwide to impose stay at home orders for their citizens. So activities of all sorts, business, entertainment, even science, um, has been interrupted. As a result, conferences all over the world um, have been canceled, including the APS March meeting, um, which many of us were planning to attend to discuss polariton chemistry. All right, so um, we, the Well Yuanzhou group, and well, the Wei Zhang group at UCSD, as well as the Physical Sciences Division, decided to start the Polariton Chemistry webinars. So along with your support, um, you know, people all over the world, we're able to continue um, seminars and the um, scientific discussions, which are so invaluable for sharing new results, um, generating new ideas, and then starting new collaborations. These are, this is especially important um, especially true for rapidly growing fields such as polariton chemistry. So last week um, we had, we began the polariton chemistry webinars. So this is a weekly series every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time um, and it's free and open to everybody. All you need to do is register at this link here. So last week we had our first talk um, given by Dr. Jeffrey Aruski from the Naval Research Lab. So I'd like to give a recap of the participation. Um, so based on the feedback that we had, um, everyone um, seemed to really enjoy the webinars. And we had 211 um, total participants. Um, based because of the you know, time zones, right? And the time that we're having the seminar, it's not surprising that over half were from the US, um, but we also had more than 10 participants from the UK as well as India. Um, and then from the remaining participants, uh, most of the people um, came from Europe, right? Um, Austria, Belgium, Finland, France, Germany, Hungary, uh, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Romania, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, um, we also had, um, as well as, you know, Turkey and Israel, right, between Asia and Europe. And we also had um, people from, you know, others from North America, specifically Canada. We had representation from South America, uh, Chile and Colombia, as well as Asia, right, uh, Taiwan and South Korea. So um, we're excited that this is able to connect people from all around the world and continue our uh, discussions of um, polariton chemistry. So let's now go to this week's seminar. seminar. And also, actually, yeah, before starting, uh, I just want to say that if you didn't have a chance to see it or you want to rewatch it again, the seminar from last week given by Dr. Jeff Rusky on the dynamics of vibration cavity polaritons, um, as well as all future webinars, will be recorded and posted to the YouTube channel, um, Polariton Chemistry Webinars. So, Today, we have Professor Hui Deng from University of Michigan. So um, she received her bachelor's in applied physics at Tsinghua University. Then um, she obtained her master's in electrical engineering, her PhD in applied physics at Stanford University. 
Um, under the advising of Professor Yoshihisha Yamamoto, she carried out her pioneering work of Bose-Einstein condensates of semiconductor microcavity exon pol exciton polaritons. There, she also um, carried out notable studies on the coherence of those condensates, as well as polariton relaxation and lasing. After, um, she did her postdoc at Caltech um, with Professor Jeff Kimball, um, contributing the fundamental works on creating and measuring entanglement um, between remote atomic ensembles. Then, she started her independent career at University of Michigan, where she currently is associate professor. During her time there, um, she was also for a few months a visiting scholar at the University of Science and Technology in China. During her independent career, she resumed making important contributions to the field of semiconductor microcavity exciton polaritons, um, where she discovered new excitonic and cavity systems for more effective lasing and room temperature lasing. She also carried out work on single photon emission and quantum dots. More recently, uh, she's been focusing on spectroscopy and lasing in 2D materials, and as well as strong coupling of those materials to photonic crystals. Um, she's also won several prestigious awards, notably the AFOSR Young Investigator Program, the NSF Career Award, and the Humboldt Foundation Award. So without further ado, uh, Professor Deng, the screen is yours. You may begin sharing. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. That's the most uh, elaborate introduction I ever had. Um, I can't share my screen yet. Okay, um, let me st stop my share. Do you see the green button below? Okay, yes. Okay. Um, needless to say, it's my great pleasure to be able to speak at this webinar. Thanks very much to Joey, Wei, and uh, their colleagues for organizing this series. I have learned a great deal from last week's talk and looking forward to the upcoming ones. Um, what I have been working on is probably quite different from the main theme for this seminar. I mostly have been working on semiconductors so I will take the chance to introduce um, a number of topics we have been working on in my group in the past few years, mainly um, on two systems. The first one is with the gallium oxide based microcavities, which is the, probably one of the most mature and well understood system, which provide us a one of the cleanest platform to look at uh, some of the fundamental physics that uh, polaritons can bring us. And the other one, on the other hand, is one of the newest and perhaps the one of the very poorly understood so far system. Um, the Fender was two dimensional materials and mostly the transition metal decocogenides, where there are many new opportunities. Um, I have crammed in a lot of materials and in the hope that uh, I will give a broad but brief introduction to the things we have been working on with the hope that uh, some, some of it will be of interest or useful to you and without going into the details. Um, but if you're interested in more details of any subject, we can discuss in Q&A or offline. So we will start with the galimosinide polaritons. And why are we interested in it? Um, I don't really need an introduction to strong coupling for this crowd. I would just to say very briefly, basically strong coupling is the regime where the energy exchange between the electronic citation or excitons in our case with the photons become reversible. And in that limit, they hybrid and form new eigenmodes that uh, anti-cross in energy. Those are our upper and the lower polaritons. The condition to reach the strong coupling regime is therefore to have the exciton the photon coupling strengths to be much larger than the decay or decoherence of each of the modes. And we do that with the normal semiconductors 
by putting them inside a micro cavity to enhance the optical field so as to enhance the coupling between the excitons and the photons. So with a typical semiconductor such as gun MOSFET, um, the coupling strength is on the order of 10 millimeter volts that corresponds to a cavity Q or quality factor of a few thousand. Once we're in the strong coupling regime, the polarity mode literally can be described as superposition, the linear superposition of the exciton mode and the photon mode. So the excitons give us a strong nonlinearity unavailable in pure photon systems that brings out rich many body physics. At the same time, the photon mode leads to very light effective mass. And as a result, quantum features can manifest at high temperature. At the same time, the coupling with the photon give us a built-in optical interface, um, make the system very experimentally accessible, and also naturally landed to photonic device applications. So this merit has driven a lot of interest in polariton physics. And one of the most active topic is looking at the condensation physics or lasing from a polariton system. And there has been remarkable progresses. Polariton condensation and lasing has been observed from low temperature up to room temperature in both optically and electrically pumped devices. And those polariton condensates can be very well described as a coherent nonlinear fluid. And many of the hallmarks associated with a nonlinear fluid or with a superfluid has been um, observed in the polariton condensate. And more recently, there has been intense effort to create a lower dimensional polariton system and the coupled systems um, to make up metal wave devices and Hamiltonian simulators. So to do this different things and to do them better, it is always very desirable to be able to control the properties of the polariton at will. So that motiv motivated us to develop a structure for polaritons that allow us to build in designability of the polariton mode and through a photonic crystal mirror. The conventional type of polariton systems is made of putting quantum wells inside a optical cavity on the order of the size of a wavelength, which is sandwiched between two high reflectance mirrors. And those are typically made of a huge stack of a distributed Bragg reflectors, which is 10 to 20 wavelengths thick. And those DBRs, which is the same coating as we have in our, for example, dielectric mirrors in our labs, um, they are very mature, well understood, and very robust. And at the same time, very difficult to modify their properties or to change them. So we decided to get rid of this bulky DBR and replace it with a single flat layer, a single layer of a photonic crystal slab. And the simplest type is a one D grating. And if we make this grating sub wavelengths and utilize the very high index contract between the material around the three and the air gap with the index of one, we actually can have a mirror that functions even better than the top than a distributed black reflector with a broader star band and higher reflectance. And at the same time, now we have access to the many design parameters of the grating to allow us to control the spatial and the K modes, have polarization selectivity, tunable air gap, et cetera. So that is the first platform we have been working with that I will discuss today. And here's the example. Um, of the sketch where the whole structure is still monolithically grown by molecular beam epitaxial with high crystalline quality. And the top suspended grating mirror is created by nanofabrication through e-beam lithography and etching. Mm -hmm. Well, during this process, the quantum wall layers are left in the middle untouched and undamaged. And here are some ACM images of the structure. Once we have this structure, the grating breaks the rotational symmetry. So it has 
drone polarization selectivity. In the TM polarization in this device, there is no cavity resonance. There is no cavity resonance near the exciton, so that we have uncoupled emission, uncoupled exciton emission, which is a um, dispersionless. The TE polarization, we have a very good cavity mode, so the exciton emission disappears and split into the upper and the lower polaritons. Because of this small size, the lateral size of the grating, we automatically get a very strong confinement potential, a lateral potential for the polariton modes that gives us a fully discrete mode for the polaritons. And we can match those uh, dispersions and the modes very well to the, to the um, theoretical calculations based on the standard polariton model. And that is the picture in the Fourier space where the horizontal axis is the uh, implant wave number while the vertical one is the energy. And we can also look at the wave function in the real space and they should correspond to each other through a Fourier transform. So now with the grating, now we can engineer the modes of the polaritons directly through its photon component. For example, we can implant a small um, defect to create a vortex and anti-vortex pairs in the polariton laser. And we can gently break the rotation symmetry of this defect and mix it into a, just a vortex laser. Or we can also um, use a circular grating and that will give us a, vortex, a vector beam where the polarization rotates around the axis. So those are spatial mode engineering. We can also engineer the k-space, the k-mode or the k-space dispersion. So the dispersion gives us, um, determines the phase and group velocity of the quasi-particle, their density of states, their effective mass, which in turn controls their dynamics transport properties, and in the lattice, controls the coupling and the interaction, etc. So it's a very basic and fun, an important property of the system. But it's difficult to change with, a, with a flat mirrors because the dispersion is determined by the angular dependence of the reflection phase. And for a flat mirror or distributed Bragg reflector, the reflection phase is essentially fixed at zero or pi, regardless of the incidence angle. But we can change that dependence drastically if we, if we use instead um, the, grat the gratings as shown here. And as a result, we can change the dispersion to be much steeper, for almost flat or even turn around, or even a double well shape with a saddle point. So in, besides engineering single cavity mode, we can also chain up um, many of these confined ca um, cavity systems to create a couple of systems. We can separate them apart to create an array of isolated zero dimensional polariton system, or put them closer and to form coupled, um, few coupled modes, coupled cavities, or have a long chain of them to form quasi 1D or quasi 2D arrays. And in the quasi 2D, in the 1D or 2D arrays, we can also implant defects randomly on purpose to look at the effects of the defects, um, how that affects the formation of the quantum phase, and et cetera. So that opens a very broad design space to explore the physics that, uh, or the phenomena that can come out. And before we get too carried away, we of course first have to see whether or not we can um, go to the coherent limit to create a condensate or lasing in the system. So for that, we crank up the power. This is at a low density where we have a strong non-equilibrium distribution. As we increase the laser power, the population aggregates to the ground state and eventually above the degeneracy threshold, they essentially all comes from the ground state, which is the lowest energy state for the polariton branch. And that can be shown more clearly from the input output plot on the log scale, where it shows a clear um, threshold behavior. 
which is accompanied by language narrowing as well as a continuous blue shift due to polariton interactions. And a special thing that comes with this uh, um, zero dimensional polariton system is that we get a genuine single mode polariton lazy, which means without mode competition from either nearby K modes or the orthogonal polarization. And with a truly single mode polariton lazy, we finally were able to reach the Poisson limit for the intensity uh, noise expected of a truly coherent state. In, in that limit, we are also able to um, reach the Lorentzian language without this spurious intensity fluctuation and show a shallow toneless behavior um, of the language that are basically increasing coherence time with increasing occupation number. But only until up to a certain point, then the line actually broadens to a Gaussian shape. And that has been described by a theory based on a single mode polar, uh, atom laser. And that Gaussian line broadening comes from the interactions between the polaritons in the condensate and that reflects the matter wave nature of the condensate. And interestingly, the theory is developed for single mode atom laser, but it was not really um, observed in the atom laser because their interaction is too weak. But polaritons as much as strong interactions can, can bring, up, bring us into that region. And comparing the experiment with the theory, we can also um, give us a way to obtain the few most basic dynamic properties, uh, parameters of the system, the saturation density, the coupling rate, as well as the polariton polariton interaction strength. So that's the board, that's the picture that has been well established for a polariton laser. But that's not the only phase one can have in the polariton system. So far, we talked about polaritons as if it is a ideal boson with a weak interaction, but its, but it's constituents is actually um, excitons and photons, and excitons made of electrons and holes, which are fermions. Yeah, hold on. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. So we have a question, actually. Uh, let me. So. All right. Go. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, hold on. Unmute. Go ahead. We have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Sorry. Uh, this is uh, Joel Yuan from UCSD. I, I just have a, a quick uh, naive question about uh, the Gaussian broadening that you were describing that you say reflects uh, polariton interactions. Uh, I mean, do other inhomogeneities in the sample not are, are they not able also to provide that Gaussian line shape that you are uh, suggesting? Yes. So, well, um, you, if, if the polariton splitting is much larger than the exciton broadening, then the polariton actually should have a Lorentzian language, mm -hmm. and regardless of the inhomogeneous broadening of the excitons. However, we typically want to see a clear um, Lorentzian language because there is a still um, scattering between the polaritons mm -hmm. and the, the reservoir below threshold. So um, most often we still see a Gaussian language mm -hmm. below threshold. And here it's because we um, it basically eliminated this additional intensity fluctuation and that uh, gives us a real Lorentzian language at uh, um, just above threshold. But below threshold, uh, the Gaussian landscape is just interactions with the reservoir? Yes, the Gaussian is yes. Okay, okay, thank you. And, and just a very quick question. When you were saying that with the gradings, you can control, say, the shape of the dispersion of the uh, photonic mode, like, for example, make a double well potential, do you have an estimate of how big the, the, the height of the barrier of the double well you can make it to be? Like, how big in units of EVs? So it goes up to the external energy, so it would be on the order of the um, rapid splitting. Rapid splitting. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, and just a reminder for everybody, 
Uh, if you have any questions during the talk on the, your Zoom panel, you have a raise hand button, right? It has a hand symbol. So click that and that will raise your hand. And then during an appropriate time, I will allow you, I'll unmute you and you can ask your question. Okay. And you can also put questions in the Q and A um, tab, right? And those questions will be answered at the end. All right. So um, there are a few more questions. So I'm just going to answer them now. So I will. Yeah, and then, okay, so we have another question. So I'll allow you to talk. Uh, Saeed, go ahead. Yes, hello, hi. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, I actually also have a question about uh, your slide on uh, interactions. If you could uh, go back, please. So uh, just to be clear, you are speaking of uh, you is polariton polariton interaction. Is, is that correct? Yes. So uh, there's been a lot of debates about uh, the, the interaction strength in, uh, in the case of gallium arsenide uh, and numbers spanning five orders of magnitude have been reported. And, um, you know, uh, I think this debate has uh, basically brought to light the, the, the point that is, is really a very subtle uh, a, a issue to determine the, the interaction strength and there, there can be, uh, pitfalls. And I think uh, if you have this interaction strength that you are claiming that is greater than gamma and that you are in the strongly interacting limit, I mean, you should be able to do the, 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 the smoking gun experiment, which will be uh, photon blockade, right? Where basically the interaction is so strong that just a single polariton can be in your system. So I'm wondering if you have tried this or is there any really uh, kind of smoking gun effect that you can show that you really have these strong interactions? So our interaction here is actually not very strong um, to, in terms of compared compare to the line width. So to get to the regime where we see the Gaussian broadening or the interaction becomes broader than the line width, we have an average occupancy in the ground state on the order of a thousand. So we sort of need a thousand polaritons in order to overcome the line width. But uh, this uh, is partly because our cavity is uh, not a great one. That was our first generation cavity. So the lifetime is uh, three picoseconds. So, we, so it's, not the, it's not the single polariton polariton interaction, but rather is the, the total interaction energy, which is the single particle interaction times the density. The big U is the total. The small U is the single is the part two polariton interaction. Yes. I see. And okay. the, that value is consistent with the, most of the literature. I think it's a, a few micro EV per um, micron square. Yes. So, right. So I think uh, most of the measured value for gallium arsenide fall into that range within one order magnitude. There was a, one report um, which has a much, much, much higher Non-linearity. I think that's still under debate. What is going yes. on? Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have just one more question. So, uh, uh, Gilad, I will. I've allowed you to talk. Uh, hold on. Uh, yes, I have a simple experimental question. Uh, so you showed the, you showed this dispersion map that collapses into a single state when you have the condensate. Can you explain how experimentally you uh, um, obtained this map? How you measure it? Okay, yeah, I didn't put a setup here. It's so basically um, an image in the Fourier space. So, uh -huh. right, okay. so, okay. So you image the Fourier space on the microscope or? Yes, we use a, a Fourier imaging system for the Fourier space image and uh, um, sent into a spectrometer. So one axis of the spectrometer is used at the Fourier space distribution. The other axis is where we disperse the wavelengths and measure the energy. I see, thank you very much. Okay, you may resume your talk. Okay, <laughs> great. Thanks very much for the questions. Um, so, 
Right, so so far we basically consider polar etons as a very good bosons, but that actually only works in the very low density limit where the fermionic effect of its underlying constituents um, don't show up or the Fermi statistics do not matter yet. However, if we increase the excitation density, um, the electron hole occupancy will increase and eventually it will become a significant fraction of one or the Fermi statistics can no longer be negligible. And all the way until the full, full Fermi degeneracy and then we have our um, very typical Fermi drug distribution, a step-like function. So what happens when we keep increasing intensity? So that has been already explored um, more than half a century ago in theory. And it turns out that there is a beautiful theory to show that um, the many body ground state of the system actually can be written as a BCS wave function, the same as the famed Barton Cooper Schiffer state for a conventional superconductor. Except here, the pairing is between, not between two electrons forming a Cooper pair, but between a electron and a hole. A particle and a whole pairing and through Coulomb interaction, through the screen Coulomb interaction. So the theory has been developed over the half century, um, but it's difficult to see in exciton systems, so somewhat not expected because with the increasing intensity, the defacing increases while interaction decreases. So we mostly get a classical gas instead of a quantum um, many body state. But when the polaritons come around, and Peter Little's group had a Cambridge at that time, generalized the BCS theory to the polariton system, adding the photon coupling. And with the hope that a photon now actually can enforce long range coherence, and perhaps the BCS state will become more likely to be realized. So there has been a lot of uh, theoretical work, and particularly in this one, which showed the coupling between exciton and photon can also provide a pairing mechanism, even in the absence of Coulomb interactions. And there has also been a few experimental studies, but the evidence has been elusive because it is subtle. So if we consider the three main many body phases in the polariton system, that's the BC, the BCAs, and eventually to the photon lasing, and to go from a subclassical gas or thermal gas to each of them is a phase transition where the coherence will build up simultaneously by the breaking of the gauge symmetry. However, between them, there's no additional symmetry breaking and it's a smooth crossover. So we can't really, so it is difficult to identify signature to go in um, from one to the other and tell the difference. To tell the difference between the BCBCs versus the photon laser has already been well established because the, um, the underlying microscopic picture um, uh, is very different. So for the BEC case, the, the quasi-particle that uh, forms the quantum gas are the well-bound excitons. They are very tightly bound into um, exciton with a, a Bohr radius much smaller than the spacing. In the BCA's case, the electron hole are still paired up similar to couple pairs, although with a much weaker bonding and a much more spread wave function. However, in both the cases, we have a bound state in the matter media. In the photon laser limit, the Coulomb interaction is so strongly screened, we essentially have electron hole plasma without a bonding between the electrons and holes. And that leads to very different spectral features that we have used so far to identify a polariton laser versus a photon laser. But that do not tell apart a polariton BEC versus a polariton BCS. To tell apart these two, the difference has to go into the electron hole distribution, whether we are in the non-degenerate limit or the Fermi degenerate limit. So the BC is at a very low density, far below degeneracy, while the BCAs and the lasing is in the limit with the Fermi degeneracy, with a small population inversion for the BCAs limit and a strong population inversion in the photon laser limit. 
So we have to look into the electronic populations or the properties to distinguish between the Bs and the BCS phase. And that is difficult to do with optical methods. And our grating cavity came in to rescue in the way that it breaks the rotation symmetry and enforces T and the TM polarizations. For strong coupling with TE and weak coupling for TM, that allows us to simultaneously access both the coupled modes and its matter component through the TM. And linear polarization is basically a superposition of the two circular polarizations that couple to the two underlying spin up and spin down transitions for the excitons. And as a result, working with the linear polarization also ensures spin balance so that we can safely infer what happens in the matter component from the TN because it shares the same, uh, same reservoir as the TE mode. So we can take a cavity with, a, in this case, a bit lower quality factor. And again, we see the lasing behavior and as a very typical of we always add that, often consider as a polariton BC or polariton laser. Um, it is also very distinct from a photon laser. Here for the polariton laser, we have a, always have a very well defined um, ground state, which is slowly blue shifts and it maintains a fairly narrow line width until it goes above threshold and the line la narrows. But in the photon laser case, the mode, the well defined mode bound state, the mode actually disappears and melts away, and we can have very broad emission all the way from the exciton energy to the cavity energy until it collapses and the lasers in the cavity mode. So that distinction is very clear. But how do we know which um, density regime it is in? We can look at the um, reflectance spectrum of the TM that gives us the um, absorption or gain spectrum of the exciton reservoir. And very surprisingly, there is clearly population inversion of fermionic gain has shown more clearly in the zoomed in picture above the lasing threshold. So that basically puts it out of any doubt that we're not in the BEC limit, rather we're in the BCS limit for this polariton laser. And to understand that better, we work, we have to um, compare with the theoretical uh, models. And that was developed by um, my collaborator, Ro Professor Rolf Binder in University of Arizona, who is an expert on this type of calculations using um, non-equilibrium Green's function and the semiconductor block equations. Um, it took a few years actually for us to recognize um, this is actually the mechanism and to have the theory calibrated um, by the experiment. And once that, uh, once we achieved that uh, experiment theory agreement, we can use the theory to look at the microscopics that we cannot measure in experiment. So um, here are the results of the theory comparing the polariton BCAs. Uh, ideal BCAs defined as a BCAs in the isolated and non-dissipative system and versus a photon laser. So the main takeaway is that uh, the quantitative features are similar between polariton ideal BCS states, but different from the photon laser. But quantitatively, there is a clear distinction between our polariton BCS and the ideal BCS because of the dissipation. For example, the um, gap, BCS gap is greatly reduced because of the um, dissipation and decoherence. However, dissipation is not always doing bad things. So that brings us to the next topic, where the dissipation actually can introduce new physics. So for that, um, we actually need beyond just a single cavity and look at uh, oh, two uh, Professor Day, cavities. Professor Day, uh, we actually yeah. have uh, some questions. Sure. So, uh, Binod, I'm going to allow you to talk. Go ahead. Hey, Hui. Um, quick question on the uh, previous slide. So, when you, when you say you have the polariton BCS, is there an evidence of a gap formation? 
And if so, is there a way to probe that gap? So if to probe that gap, we may need something like a um, terahertz spectroscopy. And what's the order of the gap here? Just in a, a few milli electron volts. So, right, so the, the, here is a, depending on the density, yeah. Yeah, basically a few milli electron volts using the parameters of our um, okay. system. So like a terahertz probe experiment would be something ideal in this case. Right, but one still need to interpret data very carefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Sure. So moving on to our coupled cavities, the um, two coupled cavities are actually very well understood or two coupled condensate um, through a coherent Johnson coupling. They will um, split and form a uh, lower energy bonding state with a symmetric wave function and a higher energy anti-bonding state with a asymmetric, anti-symmetric wave function. And we can implement that quite straightforwardly with our grating cavity. For example, we can change the test ring pattern around that will need to a slightly different bending um, across, the grate, uh, across the suspended grating. And that bending changes the effective cavity lens, and that changes the cavity resonance, and that gives us an effective potential for the polaritons, as shown here. So we have a, um, a symmetric bonding mode at the lower energy, and the anti-symmetric um, anti-bonding mode at the high energy, as shown here, which is also clearly seen in the case space image. And the next energy, the next mode will be quite a bit higher in energy. So we'll focus on the two lower energy modes and look at what happens when we increase the excitation density. At high excitation densities, where we have our lasing, as expected, we should always get lasing in the lowest energy state at high enough densities, which is the bonding mode lasing. But what surprised us was what happened in between. In the, in the window of the excitation densities, suddenly multiple frequency lines appeared out of nowhere. So the next available eigenstate is up there, so it is quite far from the next available state, but in the spectral range between the original antibonding and the bonding state. But there are clearly multiple lines, and we can see the beating in the frequency in the um, G1 coherence measurements as well. It took us quite a while to figure out what is happening there. And it turns out that basically there is a new time scale and the energy scale introduced into the system that's not part of the original eigen energy. And that is a classic example of nonlinear dynamics with a limited cycle. Um, it's a, actually a very um, it, it actually underpins a very broad range of phenomena, but is typically a solution very difficult to find or to control in engineered experimental systems. So I wasn't knowledgeable enough about the nonlinear dynamics to figure that out, but we found out a, a very beautiful theory work published a few years before our experiment was done, which predicted exactly what we have seen. And the idea is, the, the basic idea is that uh, in a dissipative system, when we form the, when, when the two cavities couple, not only the energy will split, but also the dissipation rate of the coupled modes can become different. And that adds effectively to a real part to the coupling between the two cavities and makes it a complex coupling term. And that leads to very rich phenomena. Um, resulting from this dissipative coupling. And one of these phenomena predicted was the limited cycles um, that leads to spontaneous oscillation and periodic doubling. It predicted a number of uh, signatures of such a phase and it turns out all checked out in the experiment, such as equidistant frequency lines, asymmetric intensity distribution, and a particularly interesting one is a relative phase between the two cavities that is not zero or pi. And we can measure that by interfering the two 
two cavities with a common phase preference and find out the phase difference as seen um, in the shift of the fringes, which is indeed between zero and pi and converges toward zero as we go toward a stable bonding state lazy. So with that, I have a small phase diagram going from a thermal state to perhaps a small window anti-bonding mode lazy, then to the limited cycles, limited cycles until it goes to the finally the stable fixed point of a bonding mode lazy. Oh, uh, we have a question. Okay, uh, hold on, go ahead. Oh, hi, uh, sorry. Uh, when you say that there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking on the phase of the coupling, uh, if you say, would this uh, phase be affected by a magnetic field? So I, would you be able to bias the uh, phase of this coupling towards particular uh, values uh, with magnetic fields? So the, the relative phase here is a two, unless you change the, unless you apply magnetic field between the two. And that probably will have an influence on the phase. Although typically the excitons are um, neutral particles. So they, uh, they only see a magnetic shift and really that, uh, right, and don't see the thing. Um. Sorry, sorry. Can you repeat very quickly what you said because uh, the the connection was not very was broken. So, so sorry. Can you just say it again? So, if you apply a magnetic field gradient, the two that should shift to the that could shift to the face. Uh -huh. um, that's in um, that would be a sort of long equilibrium situation. So in this case, it's, uh, um, it's actually a steady state. Even though there is spontaneous oscillation, it is a steady state of the system. But, but just like you see, say, uh, delta phi equals 0.51 pi, you also see the minus 0.51 pi, right? Like there is no reason why you should have that particular, like, like is there a continuous symmetry? Uh, uh, so or, the... Right. The reason there is this phase difference is because of the um, uh, oscillation in the phase space mm -hmm. with the limited cycles. Right. If, mm -hmm. if there isn't this uh, oscillation in the phase space, then we would have uh, either a stable bonding state or a stable anti-bonding state. And the bonding state would have a phase delta phi of zero, and the anti-bonding state would have a delta phi of pi. Yeah. And we may apply certain external fields to change the phase difference for the bonding or anti-bonding state to a certain fixed value. But if we go to the limited cycle phase, it will still again have a phase difference between these uh, values determined by the eigenstates. Okay, but it's not just any arbitrary phase, like, or like you, there is no equal probability of getting any phase between? No, no, ah, no. Okay, okay. Yeah, what you get depends on the interaction Right. Okay. Depends on the dissipative coupling strengths and the polariton polariton interaction. Okay, thank you very much. So that actually concludes my discussion about the Gallimasonite polariton system. And if there are no more questions about the Gallimasonite for now, I will switch gears to 2D materials. So why 2D materials? I guess it's uh, everybody already knows many of the remarkable properties of those Van der Waals crystals. And particularly relevant for optic studies is because of the strongly reduced Coulomb screening that leads to a very large binding energy and strong exciton photon interactions in this system. And even highly, higher excited states can, be, can become very stable in these materials. Um, it also have a um, some special unique properties such as spin valley locking. And a particular blessing is the fabrication flexibility and the lack of uh, tangling bonds let, let us to integrate the materials rather freely without having to worry about uh, lattice matching. We can put on any substrate or photonic structure and create heterostructures the Lego way. 
So that, what that means is that we suddenly have a flexibility to create cavities and create polaritons in a way that's not possible with conventional materials. For example, we don't even need to worry about making a mirror out of photonic crystal. We can just use the photonic crystal resonance itself. And this, again, an example of this, uh, simply a grating structure. The field can be strongly confined on this uh, 100 nanometer scale um, thick grating. And the, the field is evanescent out of the grating. However, the, at the surface of grating, the evanescent field is still very strong. And that's where we can put our one nanometer thick 2D materials. And here's an example to show that uh, with such a grating, we can change nothing except the period of the grating and tune the wavelengths to cover all the commonly studied for 2D um, transition metal that collagenides. And as example, if we put on tungsten disulfide on such a photonic crystal grating, and we right away get a strong coupling, which is almost avoidable, where the cavity mode splits into the upper and the lower polariton branches, shown in the reflection as well as the photomolescence, and compares very well between experiment and the simulation. And those uh, photon crystal polariton modes also have some peculiar properties of its own. For example, we can easily change the background reflectance instead of always a very high reflectance of a star band for fiber cavities. We could put the background reflectance to be either in the valley or in the peak. And we can also change the line shape of the polariton resonance um, for in reflectance from a symmetric Lorentzian line to a highly anti-symmetric um, final line shape. And we can push our luck a bit further to see if we can get to a coherent light matter interaction even without a cavity. And that goes to the region um, named the collective lamp shift region, where it has been studied with a number of systems, but has not been done with excitons in semiconductors coupled with optical fields. And the difficulty is that uh, to reach that limit, we would need the radiative line width to, um, to be comparable to the total line width or to be a dominant uh, contribution to the total line width. And that is extremely difficult with the conventional semiconductors with all the inhomogeneity and the, and the um, defacing. But in the, the um, monolayer TMDs, it has been shown that the limit is readily achieved in high quality monolayers. And to verify that, we, to, or to observe those phenomena, we also need a reference to tune um, through the different regimes, and that we can do by simply placing a movable mirror behind the 2D material. And at last, the super reading effect, or the collective lens shift, um, goes away on the length scale of the wavelength and in 3D or 2D. However, in the 2D material, since the, with the two-dimensional translational invariance of the material, the field the excitons couple to propagates only in 1D. So they do reduces the field into a 1D system. And in that way, by energy conservation, the field amplitude never decays so that we can have the same collective inter interaction um, over arbitrarily long distance if we don't worry about the retardation or the effects. And that is the result we have in this uh, half cavity system where we put a 2D material in front of a cavity, in, in front of a, just one mirror, and the move, change the distance between the mirror and the molar layer. That give us, give us a modulation directly over the radiative decay rate and correspondingly a shift of the resonance energy with a, a pi over two phase shift between the two sinusoidal modulation as expected from the theory. Oh, uh, Professor Rudeng, I don't mean to want to rush you, but uh, we have about five minutes before the end of the hour. So um, it would be great if you could um, okay. probably uh -huh. start wrapping up. Yeah, thank you. 
So we can use this effect to modulate the external properties, for example, the value polarization and the relative ratio of the different excitations. And that is the limit where the looking at the limit where the coherent the radiative decay is strong. Um, but we can ask the question: What happens to simply absorption in that limit? The more familiar limit of absorption is where the radiative decay is much weaker compared to dissipation in the system. And we have the perturbative approach and derives the that derives the beer slope. However, when we go to the coherent limit, when the scattering disappears by energy conservation, absorption cannot happen. And that means that if it kills any scattering or dissipation, then even a monolayer can function as a perfect reflector. And something close to that has already been observed. And that's also the regime for our collective lamp shift. But going from small absorption to small absorption in between, there must be an optimal. And it turns out that there is a very robust critical coupling condition that gives us perfect absorption when the scattering and the rate of decay balance out each other. Um, we can show that more rigorously, but probably the most interesting thing is that it actually is um, observable in experiments. As shown here, we can change the relative coupling by the mirror to tune the relative coupling rate and go through the optimal. Or we can also change the scattering rate by changing the temperature to go through that optimal. Or we can also change the scattering rate by external external scattering by using an ultra-fast laser excitation and to tune the system through the optimal with a maximum absorption of 99.6% in just a single monolayer. Um, that may open um, many opportunities of uh, perfect absorption applications. So I'll just very quickly mention the last thing. If we push our lock even further, um, instead of one layer, we put another monolayer on top of the first one. Then instead of the very, very strongly bound interlay excitons, we can also form those inkly excitons. That's been done in double quantum wells with the conventional semiconductors, but the electron hole separation essentially kills any oscillator strength. However, with these Vandenwald's materials, they are only a nanometer apart. So the oscillator strength can still be strong enough to even give us lasing and, and many other interesting properties. But I will focus on the one thing most related to um, this talk, which is the strong coupling. And for that, we use this particular combination of bilayer. It has been shown um, in, first by this group where that uh, the two conduction bands are closely aligned. And as a result, the electron can tunnel between the conduction band and hybridize the interlayer and the interlayer transition. That's been shown, this, this is seen in our data here, where the interlayer exciton splits into two coupled to uh, two hybrid excitons, then both inherit a strong oscillator strength from the interlayer component. Now, if we put that into a cavity, we right away get a, a um, strong coupling where the cavity mode coupled to the two hybrid excitons and uh, split into three polaritone branches. Um, what's interesting about those uh, heterobilayer polaritons is because the excitons are strongly confined in the Moray lattice that's formed in the hydrobilayer. They essentially form a quantum dot array. And what that gives us is a very strong phase space feeling. And that alone does not change the exciton energy very much, but it changes the polariton energy significantly. And that give us, can give us much, much stronger nonlinearity for the polaritons compared to the excitons. And also, with the Mori lattice, we now have a window to tune the exciton properties on the macroscopic scale. So we can have control not only over the optical mode, but now also directly on the exciton mode. So I think I will stop there and just to show the most important slides 
of the other people who actually did all the work and our collaborators and sponsors who made the work possible. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you so much, Professor Day, for the wonderful talk. So now we will go to questions. So we're gonna alternate between questions in the Q&A tab, as well as um, any uh, live question. So let's first go to a Q&A question. So this is a question uh, from Bing. Uh, so it says, naive question, how is the interpolariton coupling measured experimentally? It means the coupling between the inter and the interlayer excitons. So let me give uh, Bing uh, the mic so he can clarify. Uh, okay, go ahead, uh, Bing, you may talk. Uh, hey, uh, hey, nice talk. Uh, th this is a question for the first part, actually. So you were, uh, you were showing this uh, interpart of coupling you. Uh... Oh, for the, for the Gallimard snake? Yeah. Uh, um, okay, uh, find the control right away. So uh, go ahead, ask the question. Oh, I was just wondering how this uh, U, uh, the interpolariton coupling, uh, is measured experimentally. Oh, um, from the coherence measurement. Um, so let's go back there. You mean for here? Yeah. And um, right, so the broadening is basically um, depends on the total interaction strength. So from the broadening, we can fit the line width very well to the theoretical formula. There is an analytical theoretical formula. If you basically consider uh, interaction with the reservoir determined by the saturation density, the outcoupling of the polaritons from the, uh, uh, for all the photons from the system and the polariton-polariton interaction strength. And that's all that uh, goes into that uh, simple model. So we can get an analytical formula and fit it with our uh, experimentally measured G1 tau. And okay. from there, we can obtain these parameters. Okay. Yeah, may I ask a follow-up? Uh, so for this coupled cavity, uh, the, you're talking about the dissipation. So what, what are the dis main dissipation in this coupled cavity system? It's mainly the cavity decay, okay. mainly the photon decay out of the cavity. Okay, thank you. Okay, so before we, we have a few questions um, from Anton in the Q&A, so I will actually allow them to um, ask their question. So uh, Anton, uh, you have the mic, go ahead. Hello, thank you very much for the nice talk. I have a question first. I'm uh, wondering if you can comment please on the way you separate polarity and polarity interaction in that experiment from the reservoir polarity interaction. How did you discriminate between them? Right, that's a good question. I didn't go into the subtleties of it. So the way we can tell it apart is by looking at the uh, second order coherence or the intensity noise. So if there is a still interaction with the reservoir, then basically you will see a, a spurious intensity in the intensity fluctuation above the Poisson limit. And yeah, does, does that make sense? So when you go to the Poisson limit, that, uh, that shows that uh, the interaction with the reservoir is now, is basically negligible compared to the interaction within the condensate. Uh, all right. Are you limited here in your resolution? Because uh, usually if we pump really hard, uh, it's quite difficult to, uh, to observe any bunching uh, against the plot or into measurements. Are you sure that you are not limited in the time resolution of your HBT apparatus here? So the time resolution is worse at lower density compared to the higher density. So the, the limited G2 value here, which is much below the expected 1.8 or something, is because of the time resolution. And the reason we can measure a large bunch in close and the bubble threshold is because the, um, we're no longer limited by the time resolution. 
the then the time the time resolution is the, basically becomes the pulse width of the emission rather than the detector resolution. Right. Right. So the limitation from time resolution is uh, less and less severe as we increase excitation intensity. I see. Okay. Uh, all right. And the, the second question I had uh, regarding your limit cycle uh, part of your talk, I was wondering if you can comment a little bit about the typical frequencies of your limit cycle. Uh, your limit cycles, which you observe. Uh, which frequency? Uh, frequency of the oscillations. Uh, the frequency of the oscillation. So that corresponds to the um, um, the spectral stability um, of the of the basically new frequency lines. That's a fraction of uh, mean electron volts. So that's a gigahertz. Mm, I see. Yeah, not a gigahertz. Yes. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, so do we have any final questions? We have time probably just for one last question. So please read. Oh, okay, actually, we do. Okay, so let me see. Let me, uh, oh, let me see. Okay, yeah. Okay, so hello, go ahead. Oh, uh, hi, uh, sorry. Uh, I have a question about the more. Uh, super lattice and the effect that you say that uh, it will enhance this uh, the nonlinear uh, optics of the polariton. Uh, I mean, shouldn't it also enhance the? I mean, so is this just due to strong exciton exciton interactions within the well of the each of the moire unit cells, or or what is the effect that you are talking about? Um, it's a phase space filling or the saturation of the exciton photon coupling strands. So if you already created the excitation in the Mori cell, you cannot put in another because it's more like a quantum dot. Okay. For, for, yeah. So. But this is uh, right. within so, a radius, right? So like, okay, so like, uh, I mean, phase space filling even exists also without the Moiré pattern. Uh, but yes. Here, yes. Yes. So a, a way to see it is that if you have a quantum well, a 2D exciton, then we know the saturation density is basically one over four radius squared. Yes. And in this case, if we, if we have a quantum dot array, then the saturation density is basically one particle per quantum dot. So that would be the one over the period squared. And the period is about 10 times of the Bohr radius. But what I don't understand is that if you, I mean, uh, okay, so uh, uh, there is a limit to which the the unit cell area of these quantum dots, uh, I mean, if you make it larger and larger, you you go back to the to the limit of the of the of the Bohr radius squared, right? Like, so there must be a limit to uh, right, right. So you do need uh, the discrete states. So if you make the quantum dots too big, basically the excited states. Um, becomes closer and closer. Mm -hmm. So you can, although you don't go to the ground state, but you can put another exciton in the excited state. I see. So what is like the limit of this uh, area of the quantum dots that you're talking about? Um, that is a good question. I haven't uh, did that. I haven't done that calculation. So um, I think the the way the, the reason we could see such a small saturation density. Um, it's because the next uh, um, excited state of the excitons is still far enough from um, from the one we couple to the cavity, or it is not bound anymore. So the one that can couple to the cavity um, has to be basically is the one that can only accommodate one excitation per Mori cell. I see. Thank you very much. All right. So. Um, now I just want to make a few last announcements before we go. So I'm going to um, share my screen. Okay. So just to let you know, so next week we have 
the talk. Uh, same time, don't forget to register. It's, uh, so the talk is Strong Light Matter Coupling and 2D Materials, given by Professor Vinod Minon from City College of New York. And the last thing I want to say is uh, let's thank the speaker, Professor Dang, again, for a wonderful talk. And thank you so much for your attendance. All right, so have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy. All right, bye-bye.